Class is now in session. I am Professor Hockey, and today we're discussing game 49 of the regular season between the San Jose Sharks and the Vegas Golden Knights, in which the Sharks have lost 4 to 1. It has been three games since the Sharks returned from their almost two week breaks due to the Olympics occurring. Uh, and they've played games against the Oilers, the Canucks, and the Golden Knights. Three teams in their division, two of them at the very least, maybe not the Golden Knights, but two of them that they are fighting for a playoff spot with. And in the game against the Oilers, they played a terrible first period and fell behind 2-0. In the game against the Vancouver Canucks, they played a terrible first period and fell behind 2-0. In the game here tonight against the Vegas Golden Knights, their first period honestly wasn't too, too bad. But can you guess what happened anyway? That's right, they fell behind 2-0. The Sharks showing remarkable consistency there, and I had said that their first period wasn't all that bad here tonight, which is somewhat true, but that's just a very, very small amount of good news, I guess you could say, in the large pile of bad news that currently sees the San Jose Sharks having lost 8 of their last 9 games, and seeing the Sharks currently sit 10 points out of a playoff spot where they would have to leapfrog multiple teams, five teams, just to be able to steal a playoff spot. And this is with just over 30 games remaining. Most people take a look at the playoff picture by the time Thanksgiving rolls around in November when they're trying to see which teams are going to be in the playoffs. And this is now three months later and a good 30 plus games later as well, the Sharks currently find themselves 10 points out. So for those who may have been hoping, holding out hope still that the Sharks could make some sort of playoff push, well, that hope should be dwindling at this point point but as we move on into uh, this game I guess you could say I did mention the Sharks did not look terrible in this first period honestly with better goaltending they probably find themselves uh, at the very least only down 1-0 but potentially even in a tie game Reimer did not have a particularly good game here tonight and so Kolasar scores to make it 1-0 for the Vegas Golden Knights and then of course it is Jack Eichel his first as a Golden Knight to make it 2-0 I don't know if that counts as a first goal that the Sharks usually give up because because it is his first goal for Vegas, and he hasn't played a game in about a year. Well, he played two games previously for the Golden Knights, but he hasn't played many games over the past year, I guess you could say. But anyway, the Sharks were trailing 2-0 at the end of the first period. In the second period, the Sharks actually still did not look too bad, got some decent chances for themselves, got some decent shots on net, actually outshot the Golden Knights in that particular period, and yet they were the team to give up the goal. It ended up being a 3-0 Golden Knights lead after 40 minutes. Now, the Sharks would manage to make it somewhat respectable by getting a goal from Nick Bonino. This was only because the Vegas Golden Knights were seemingly distracted by the fact that Cogliano kind of gave a light push to Shea Theodore, who then completely fell over. It kind of looked like a tripping penalty at real time, though the referees, I believe at the very least, made the correct call and not calling this a tripping penalty, and Bonino took advantage of the confusion to grab a nice pass and score that goal but the Sharks would be unable to complete the comeback they did not have that same type of down 3-0 magic in a game against the Vegas Golden Knights like they did game 7 a few years ago and they'd give up the empty netter to Chandler Stevenson to drop the game for one into the players to talk about we have the first line of Meyer, uh, Meyer Hurdle and Barabanov and usually this first line can be counted on to be very very good but here tonight this was the rare off game for these three players they didn't generate a ton of chances for themselves. They had obviously the couple that they're always going to get just because they are skilled players. But I would say as a whole, this line was not necessarily all that great. They were coming in below expectations. And particularly on the defensive side of things, I was quite disappointed with Timo Meyer's performance on this second goal for the Golden Knights. He should have been the one covering Jack Eichel. But for whatever reason, maybe he forgot that Jack Eichel was even a player because he's played so little over the past year. But Meyer does not stick with him Eichel scores that goal and it's just a disappointing thing to see Meyer has been so good for the San Jose Sharks this season but that does not mean that you can excuse when he makes certain blunders like he did at that point but what I specifically want to talk about here tonight is actually having to do with the Sharks second line so Rudolph Spalsers returns to the lineup here tonight he missed the last game due to that shot he blocked in uh, the game against the Edmonton Oilers and of course he is joined by his usual center Logan Couture on the second line but 
who is their other winger there? It is none other than Matt Nieto. You see, when Matt Nieto re-signed with the San Jose Sharks this past offseason, I was relatively happy, but also somewhat nervous. I was kind of happy because of the fact that Nieto is a solid penalty killer, and he can play some decent minutes, usually on the fourth line, potentially stretching to the third line if necessary. But I was also a bit nervous because for whatever reason, I had this sinking feeling that he'd somehow weasel his way into the top six at some point because Bob Booners likes to do that for whatever reason and that's exactly what happens here tonight so Jonathan Dallin obviously hasn't been performing all that well over these past couple of games I guess if you take from the return uh, from the Olympic break most of the Sharks players haven't been necessarily looking all that great, especially that game against the Edmonton Oilers, but since Dallin is the rookie, he ends up being the one who takes the punishment of sorts, and he is demoted down to the fourth line with VL and Peterson, and for whatever reason, it is Matt Nieto who's brought up to the second line. I just cannot take a team seriously who says that they want to make it to the playoffs while sitting 10 points out of a playoff spot, and then decide to put a career fourth liner, and at best, maybe third liner, onto the second line into that top six trying to win a game it just doesn't make any sense to me he had gotten a he got an overtime shift in the previous one against the Vancouver Canucks he got some power play time in this game for whatever reason it's just I don't understand the logic here sure I know you're a coach and you want to send the message to the rookie player this is just like a tale as true as time basically at this point uh, or tale as old as time I should say but I feel as though there were better options to play on that second line. I mean, the easiest one to go with is someone like Noah Gregor, who, by the way, I thought actually had a pretty good game here tonight, got a couple of chances, and even though he is the most snake-bitten player in the entire universe, at the very least, he has a couple of other line mates who are capable of actually putting the puck in the net with Couture and Balsers, so Gregor was a possible option there, or why not, I don't know, call up a player from the Barracuda to try and do something there. Maybe a Blickfeld could be given an opportunity, maybe bring back Helbega who was actually pretty good in his few stints that he had with the Sharks this season and then was demoted for no particular reason, I would say. Uh, anyone, honestly, would be better than Matt Nieto because this is just never actually going to work out. I just don't understand the logic here. It kind of reminds me of earlier on in the season when they had Nick Bonino as the Sharks' first line center. It just doesn't make any sense. And the second line expectedly did not perform particularly well. With the third line, however, that ended up getting a bit of a shakeup with Matt Nieto getting that in inexplicable promotion. Bonino and Cogliano were joined by Noah Gregor, and that gave an immediate boost to this third line. They were potentially one of the better lines for the San Jose Sharks here tonight. Generated a couple of chances. I already mentioned how Noah Gregor got a couple for himself. Nick Bonino obviously scored a goal, and for the first time, or not the first time in a while, but for one of those rare times where the third line was not hemmed into their zone completely, actually managed to control the ice for the, you know, a good chunk of the shifts that they played. So that was definitely somewhat nice to see. When it comes to the fourth line, Dallin ended up being joined by VL and Peterson. Honestly, you can't really expect Dallin to do much of anything, especially when you consider the fact, you know, when Noah Gregor was on that fourth line, it made a bit more sense because Gregor, he has a ton of speed for himself. So he's able to create some chances by himself. So even if he's playing with somewhat pylon type of players, traffic cones, basically like Lane Peterson and Jeff VL, no offense to them. Uh, he's able to do some stuff on his own. But with Jonathan Dallin, what we have seen this season from him is that he's much more of a complimentary player. At the very least, at this point in his career as a rookie, he's not necessarily driving his own line. So when you play him with VL and Peterson, you can't really expect much. And um, there's literally zero surprise from my end that Dallin didn't really do much of anything here tonight. Hopefully, this is the message sent situation and Dallin can move back up to the second line because if I have to watch Matt Nieto in a second line position once again, I may just turn off the TV. On to the defensive side of things, and this is where I think some of the Sharks' problems are really fallen onto in these past three games, and in particular, I feel as though it is this first defensive pairing. Brent Burns and Mario Ferraro last season were actually quite solid. In particular, Ferraro had an explosive year where he established himself as a solid top four defenseman and was playing a top two role, not necessarily super effectively for the San Jose Sharks, but he was doing a relatively admirable job 
And while Brent Burns obviously was a shadow of his former self from a few years ago, he was still playing an okay style of game last season. But this year, Brent Burns has seemingly regressed further. He's had some moments of strong play earlier on this season and at times sprinkled in here or there, but so often he is a player who is founding himself completely out of position and just not really doing a good job in the defensive zone. And it seems as though those bad habits, in a way, have kind of rubbed off onto Mario Ferrara, who has also been having himself a pretty tough stretch of games, I would say. Over these past nine games that the Sharks have lost eight of them, Mario Ferraro just has not looked as good as he did last season, and it's been somewhat disappointing to see because, of course, this was a year that it was expected that Mario Ferraro was going to take a step forward, and I know a lot of people watch these games and try and put a lot of blame onto Brent Burns for that. They say that Brent Burns is weighing down Mario Ferraro, and there may be some grains of truth to that. However, for anyone who's watching these games here and you watch Mario Ferraro play, he is also finding himself very frequently out of position. I talked about uh, the, the Meyer issues with that Eichel goal, but there have been Ferraro issues not just this game, but in many previous games that I haven't actually uh, brought up, I would say. But at this point, I'm kind of just at the end of the line. I've been giving a lot of give to Mario Ferraro because he's been thrust into this role rather quickly as a top two defenseman without much development time. And usually defensemen take uh, a decent bit longer than forwards to develop as rookie. And Mario Ferraro is still very, very young uh, at the NHL level. But at this point, if again, you're that team, you're trying to make the playoffs, apparently you're 10 points out and this uh, first pairing is just not really cutting it for the San Jose Sharks. When it comes to the other four players, I wouldn't say they've been necessarily terrible, but they certainly haven't been all that great. Uh, Ryan Merkley, I guess, had a decent game here tonight, uh, but he continues to be a situation where he's just not being allowed to do much of anything in these games. It feels as though... Uh, there's so many eyes on him from Bob Booner where it's essentially you make one mistake and you're out of the lineup that Ryan Merkley is kind of limiting himself a bit. I mean, there was this one uh, shot that he ended up taking. I don't remember which period this was in, but that's not really the important part. He kind of handles the puck at the blue line, you know, something that you would expect a player like Ryan Merkley to do, just as you would expect a player like Brent Burns or Eric Carlson to do. And after handling the puck for maybe a half second to a second, he takes the shot and there's a potential rebound, but it ends up being a save for Logan Thompson. And the commentator for the game even mentioned, oh, you need to be able to get that shot away right away. That's you know, a comment that you make for a defensive defenseman, for a Jacob Middleton, because you're not really expecting much of a play to happen with the puck. Just kind of get the puck to the net and allow your forwards, who are more offensively gifted than you, to make the chances happen. But with Ryan Merkley, you're hoping some sort of play can at the blue line. Maybe he's looking for a passing lane. Maybe he's looking to take a better shot. And so if you're going to chastise him like that, just as I suspect that the, uh, the Sharks coaching staff is doing the exact same thing, you're not going to develop him the correct Correct way. So I like to see Ryan Merkley in the lineup, but I'd like to be I'd like for him to be given much more leeway than he's currently is to maybe try more offensive plays. So and even if he does make that mistake, he pinches up too aggressively on in the offensive zone and ends up being a two-on-one the other way, and the other team scores to not just bench him for the rest of the game and then no, not play him for the next two weeks. Let him do what he does best, and maybe you'll actually get some offense out of him. And finally, we can talk about James Reimer. I already mentioned earlier on that this was a rough game for Reimer, and it absolutely was. Of the three goals scored by the Golden Knights on a man net, two of them were ones that he would absolutely want. Uh, uh, like back. I believe the Colossar one does deflect off of the stick of Lassic, but it's a pretty subtle deflection and it's from kind of far out and there's no real traffic in front. So I just, I expect Reimer to make that save anyway. The patch ready one is just pretty much inexcusable from that particular angle. And then when it comes to the Eichel one, poor coverage in front. Eichel has some place to work with, but it's also a bit of an awkward angle for Eichel, I would say. And so Reimer could have made that save, but I guess it's not necessarily expected. But generally, at best, this game probably should have been a 1-1 game heading to overtime, just Reimer having an off night. But that would do it for this review. The Sharks will indeed be back in action on Tuesday, and we'll see if the San Jose Sharks can actually break out of this losing streak. Like I said, eight of their last nine, they're 10 points out of a playoff spot, and if they still want to try and make it, something has to turn around soon. Class dismissed.